One of my first jobs there years ago when I first started was separating eggs. I would work every Monday basically making cookies. That was my big thing. Well, Danish was only maybe 25 cents, you know, things were cheap. I was uh, doing cleanup work there on Saturdays for, until I got my driver's license. As a child, he made my birthday cakes a couple of times, and that was exciting. Sometimes, and I don't know why, they would go to one of the other bakeries. They seemed to like that bread better. <laughs> Mattern's Bakery on uh, Kentucky Street is what I remember the most because when I was going to St. Vincent's with her, I, my bicycle, I'd come by Mattern's on the way home and pick up three loaves for a quarter. It was interesting back then. I could just remember as a kid, I mean, everybody went to the bakery every day. It wasn't that you went to the supermarket to get your bread or whatever, you went to the bakery. That's what everybody did. Here we are in a replica of a typical Victorian kitchen as portrayed by the Petaluma Historical Museum and Library. These are the tools of baking here and we're going to explore the baking industry in Petaluma in this episode of Petaluma Memories. looking for a job and he knew me from my mother used to work there years before and uh, so he offered me the job as a cleanup boy and I went, so I went to work. We was looking for summertime work. Uh, Ray and Jen Cheney, they took my application, they called me back a couple days later and they hired me. I was uh, doing cleanup work there on Saturdays for, until I got my driver's license. One of my first jobs there years ago when I first started was separating eggs. And you stand there and you separate about a crate and a half of eggs <laughs> to uh, get the egg whites so they can make the, you know, angel food cakes or use the meringue for the meringue pies. We would go in and we'd clean up, sweep. We had, Maintenance was a, was a big thing. You had to keep things pretty clean and for the health department when they would come in. Well, I, I cleaned up there until I, it was after I finished high school, actually, and could work all day long that I learned how to bake. I cleaned up there and then for about a year and a half, then Ramey came up and wanted to know if I'd like to learn the trade. And I said, I sure would. And then he decided to come in and I'd do a little bit here and a little bit there. and. By the time I was going to high school, like I said, I was going to, I'd go to school at 9 o'clock, I'd go to work at 2 in the morning. I'd get out of, of school, or work, go to school, come back after school and finish up. And then I did that for quite a while, all through my, my senior year in high school. For recipes, when we baked there, they would make their, we made everything from scratch. What, that's what we call it, scratch. For, uh, and, and we had recipes for everything and but those recipes have been had been there for, we'd use for years so and then once you once you use all the time you, you had it in your head you didn't have to read a recipe to do it you just went ahead and made them then the day i graduated from high school in 1965 i had already been baking i knew i had the, had a job i went down and brought a brand new buick grand sport from Buick Garage here in town. I was 16 years, I was 17 years old when I graduated from high school. I had enough money. I think with my friends, what bothered them the most is I always had money for everything I, I needed. 
I wasn't asking my mom for an allowance to go to the movies on the weekend or for money to go out and get a hamburger or something. I always had the money in my pocket. Typical Victorian kitchen had a baking entity and the staples of that entity were of course the rolling pin, the flour sifter, the baking powder and eventually the bread box to put the finished product in. All bakeries entities in, Petaluma, in Victorian Petaluma kitchens had a bin table. In the bin table you kept salt and sugar and of course the flour and you rolled out the bread on top of the bin table. The baking industry in San Francisco Bay Area got its real start in 1849 when the gold miners discovered French sourdough bread. By 1860 there were over 70 bakers in the San Francisco Bay Area and some of those were right here in Petaluma. In 1869 a gold miner Henry Doring founded the U.S. Bakery at 141 Main Street in Petaluma. It was a great success. It was compared to the Delmonico's of San Francisco and it lasted for 124 years right there at the same location 141 Main Street. 141 Main Street is now 141 Petaluma Boulevard North. But guess what? It still houses a bakery to this day. Well, my relationship to the Schindler Bakery, it was originally started by my grandfather. Him and his brother came over from Vienna in the 1800s. My uh, uncle, years later, opened up another bakery in town. He had moved around from San Rafael and then he opened a bakery there in San Rafael. And then from San Rafael, he eventually opened up a bakery in Petaluma. Then he called that the Schindler Bakery, and that was on Western Avenue. That's the bakery I remember going to. Um, I would go there, and my aunt would always give me cookies, and so it was always a, a real good, uh, good treat. And I remember just being amazed at watching the bread slicing machine, that she'd put that bread in there and come out in slices. Well, basically, my relationship to Schindler's Bakery was my mother married Oscar Schindler when I was five, and so he was my stepfather, and his parents owned the first uh, bakery. And then um, at that time when they were married, uh, Uncle Heine and Aunt Gladys owned the bakery. Oh, my aunt, my aunt loved working in the bakery. She had worked at the Golden, I believe it was Golden Mill Grain Company here in town for years. She did, a, I believe it was bookkeeping for them, but she loved working in the bakery. And I think she just loved uh, seeing the people and the customers. She had the gift for talking and uh, she truly loved it. When they owned the bakery and I was growing up, because I could pop in there pretty easy, you know, that was always nice. Um, I remember we didn't get to go see Uncle Heine too much because he had to get up like at two in the morning to go down to the bakery and bake bread. I know he made, uh, as a child, he made my birthday cakes a couple of times and that was exciting, having a big elaborate birthday cake just full of dinosaurs all over it and that was pretty exciting. Growing up with my mother and Oscar, um, they really never got uh, baked goods from the bakery is they would buy from the grocery store Kilpatrick's or Wonder Bread or, you know, whatever. Then sometimes, and I don't know why, they would go to one of the other bakeries. They seemed to like that bread better, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so they would like sneak in and sneak out, you know. <laughs> We went to two bakeries in Petaluma, as most people did during all those years. One was Joe's A1 Bakery, and the other one was the U.S. Bakery. And uh, my connection with Joe's A1 Bakery uh, was Joe's wife was my first boss when I, and my first job when I was 10 years old. And I delivered books for a stationery store, and Joe's wife's name is Lita. And uh, Lita was the one who gave me my assignments every day. And uh, there's a humorous story here, too, because I told Joe one time, a couple of years before he died, I said, you know, I used to take the letters Lita wrote to you during the war. I used to take them to the post office every day when I would go pick up the mail and mail the books. And he said, well, I didn't know Lita during the war. <laughs> and I said, 
Well, Joe, you ask her. I know, I'm sure she was writing to you. And it turned out she was writing to someone else, I guess. Maybe it was a brother or something, but she was not writing to Joe. <laughs> Joe worked for a baker in uh, Nevada for a long time. And then he uh, came to school in Petaluma, but then after he we got married, I think that's when he got interested in getting his own bakery. It was located on Main Street, 109 Main Street, and it was called Jose Wynn Bakery. Petaluma and bakeries just seemed like a good, good matchup, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it was a, the time or, or the way life was, but uh, bakeries were kind of uh, a big deal in, in a small town like that. They, they were kind of a gathering place, like, I, mean, I guess there were coffee shops back then too, but maybe not quite as many as there were now, and this, this was the food that, uh, that people liked uh, to pick up, and like there were no supermarkets, so you kind of, uh, when you wanted breads and things, you went to the bakeries, and when you wanted other things, you went to the grocery store. I guess we gave them good food and good products to, that they bought, and they came back. They liked it. When I look at the scrapbook uh, that my mom has, I see a lot of the people that worked at the bakery that I remember as a little kid. And uh, one of them I remember was George Dickey. And he was a baker, he was an older guy. And my, why I liked him was my dad used to tell me stories that he was an umpire in the Pacific Coast League. And he even gave me some old gloves when I was a little kid and a bat, I always remember. That was Augie Gowan. So I'd look it up and you know, Augie Gowan played in the Pacific Coast League, I think in the 30s. And he gave me a Billy Goodman glove. And these were really old and uh, so I remember him and looking at the scrapbook is also about the uh, contest for naming the bakery when they opened it and uh, even has the people's names and the name that they suggest so the it's a list of maybe 500 people in there and some of the old people from Petaluma you recognize their names um, also what else was in the scrapbook oh um, the North Bay Bakers Association, and my dad would be, you know, would be a vice president one time or a secretary. It was always revolving around the bakeries in town, the U.S., the Polly Ann, French Bakery, and my dad. There's one picture of my dad in there with a microphone on giving a demonstration of, I think, making a bread or, or something like that. And he would do that occasionally. Um, and. What else was in that scrapbook? Uh, oh, there's pictures of wedding cakes that he did back in the late 50s, early 60s that he would show people that came in that wanted to know, well, what kind of cake can I get? A lot of them have the bride and groom in the picture. They would send him the photo after the wedding with the, with the cake in it. And there's quite a few of those in there. Yeah, there's quite a bit of stuff in there that, that uh, I can remember it. It had a small article that uh, in the Argus Courier about when he opened it. One of his schoolmates and best friends was Bill Sobranis, who worked at the Argus Courier. So he would always include him, my dad, in his column. You know, he would talk to him about something. Oh, you got this big thing coming. Okay, Joe Ruprecht is making a cake for this occasion and all this stuff. So he would always get in the newspaper. I would work every Monday basically making cookies. That was my big thing and uh, he taught me how to, how to roll them out and uh, he would usually uh, make the dough and then I would uh, form them or most of them were in rolls that you cut and uh, would, I could bake them as well and, and took them out. So my big role was Mondays was, was cookie day kind of. And then on weekends when he got really busy and I got older I would uh, pack rolls um, in boxes, dinner rolls for, for weddings and things like that. I would even, you know, wash the dishes and, and did the dirty work, sweep up and that type of thing. Well, I remember Joe's Bakery and that, and <clears throat> that was, a <clears throat> what was it that I used to like, uh, was uh, uh, hmm, blackberry 
cobbler, uh, and he, he, Joe used to make them on great big sheets. Oh, they'd be about that long and about that wide, and full of blackberries and that. And uh, my, my, we used to, when we'd have a party here and that, I'd always have Helen and my wife uh, buy uh, one of those so that that, and uh, they always disappeared. <laughs> Joe's A1 was uh, the Daylight Bakery, which was run by Joe Kraus. And uh, Joe's, Joe was a good friend, so we probably we got most of our trade, I would guess. We always used to have a, a routine of Sunday morning having a Danish for breakfast. And uh, <clears throat> my wife Rita would always go down and uh, pick up some Danish, and it was a routine that uh, as long as Joe was around, uh, we followed. That marvelous smell. <laughs> You just, you can never replace the smell of a bakery. Uh, there was two bakeries. There was Joe's A1 Bakery and then the U.S. Bakery. And, uh, but Gus Ditlow, the proprietor, he, <coughs> he, was, he was quite a guy. And he was always a gentleman. And in fact, his daughter was the first, when his daughter got married, it was the first wedding I'd ever attended. And I thought that was really something, you know. But, uh, well, Ramey would be down there and there'd be some other bakers in there and we'd, I'd walk in and we'd just say, hey, it's just like walking into Cheers, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I'd carry the, the um, tray of butterhorns because I'd be on a butterhorn walk. You know, my, my dad would uh, have me go down and take the tray. It was an empty tray and I'd walk down the alley and uh, I'd go in the back door and uh, he'd load it up with the, he'd load it up with butter horns and coffee cakes. Just love those things. <laughs> and I say I'd pick at him when I was carrying the tray back up to the store. <laughs> I couldn't hold off on that, you know. Jeez. If my grandmother was buying a cake, um, it had to be for something very special, because I can't imagine that she wouldn't have been baking one herself. I really remember her going to buy bread more than anything else. Again, reading from my books and different newspaper articles, uh, I, I know they were in several different locations over the years. One time they were in the building next door to Rex Hardware. This was like in the 40s and Rex Hardware had a fire and they had to move after the fire. I'm going to look at some pictures here and some newspaper articles are from a scrapbook that my aunt uh, Gladys Schindler put together over the years. She was our family historian and she really put together a scrapbook with newspaper articles, photographs, um, that really tells the history of the bakery here. Here we go. If you see the headline here, it says, Fire Wipes Out Rex Hardware Company and the Schindler Bakery in a Spectacular Blaze. But what you're not seeing here is that that blaze was on June 21st, 1942. Uh, those of you that are familiar with Petaluma are probably familiar with the fire that Rex Hardware had just a few years ago where it actually burned down. So that was actually their second fire. The first fire again was in 1942 and it wiped out the Schindler Bakery. And according to this article, they suffered over $100,000 of uh, damages. Here's a picture of the Schindler Bakery that was at 114 Western Avenue. And it was the new bakery. And it was, a new, it was an article featured in a magazine called The Western Baker. And this was out of uh, that magazine from August of 1948. This is a, a list that my Aunt Gladys put together. It was a list of everybody that gave them flowers for the grand opening of their new bakery, June 14th, 1948, which coincidentally is the same uh, date as my Uncle Heine's birthday. You can see different people gave uh, the flower arrangements, Rex Hardware Company, Petaluma Cooperative Creamery, Hack and Hansen was an old time Petaluma company, the Daylight Bakery, uh, Dot, an art parent from Parent Funeral Chapel, another bakery, the Vienna Bakery, the Golden Eagle Milling Company, the Barber Sign Company, uh, the Kresge Company. Some of these companies are still in business today, like the Creamery, the Barber Sign Company, the Kresge Company, and of course we have Parent Swanson's Funeral Home. 
This is a newspaper ad for May 9th, 1951. It was uh, geared towards Mother's Day where they actually gave out a free orchid. And this is probably the last picture I have of Heine and Gladys. Heine died about two years after this picture was taken. And it's just a sign of the times, the glasses, the shirts. Um, it was a good time here. It was some kind of family festivity. And we up here we have his uh, obituary. This is an announcement from 1932. This would have been my grandfather's bakery. And when you look at this, it says, announcing the installation of an all-automatic electric donut machine. And what is neat about this, if you come on down here, you can see it's, what it says. It says, see these donuts made in our window. This is at the Schindler Bakery again. And this is very similar to what Krispy Kreme Donuts does these days, where they actually make the donuts there on this automatic machine, and you can see the entire donut making process. But again, this was in 1932. Well, there was a lot of, I think there was, we were talking about this the other day, I think there was as many as nine bakeries in Petaluma when I was a youngster. But the, the one that stuck out, the people would come from San Francisco to buy their rolls and stuff at the U.S. bakery. It, uh, when, when it originally started, a fellow named Gus Sitlaw owned it, and, and he ran it really a tight ship. But, but they, they put out great bakery goods there, and, and it, it was, you know, really first class. But there were a lot of bakeries in town. I, don't th I think now, per uh, pure bakery, I don't think there's one left in Petaluma. I mean, there's bakeries in grocery stores, but not a bakery bakery. When I was working in Petaluma at Rochewoka Market, Polly Ann Bakery was our one of our suppliers of the fresh donuts. And every Friday, the, the owner would bring out this great big old box top thing of donuts and turnovers and oh my god it was it was <laughs> look back it was great but it was horrible at the same time because <laughs> you could just never get enough well years ago i mean people they got along like i used to uh leave the bakery and i used to go to uh, where ashman's market where the landmark is now it used to be cal ashman had a grocery store there and i'd go and get their pickup truck and I'd go back to the bakery and get bread, and then I'd deliver to their Ashman's number two down on the boulevard, or then it was Main Street. And uh, then, <coughs> then I would uh, go back to the main store and leave off the bread, and then I'd leave their truck there and walk back to the bakery, and people don't do that anymore. Like, that, that was just two businessmen friends that got along, and that's the way they did it. Somebody needed something, there was always someone there to give them a hand or loan it to them. I don't think that was ever a problem. Sometime I think he went up to Cheney, you know, to the U.S. because he was up the street, uh, not too far up the alley. I think it was friendly competition. I remember exchanging with U.S. Bakery all the time. They would come down if they were missing something and we would go up there if we were short on something. And they were good friends, my dad and uh, Ramey Cheney and, and his wife and, um, and their son that worked at the bakery. They were the closest ones to us. But I remember him dealing also with those that owned Polly Ann Bakery. And, and uh, uh, he was real good friends with with uh, Bruno Lombardi at the French Bakery, who, who owned that. And if ever there was something that he couldn't do, like producing, I don't know, 400 loaves of bread or something, he would just, you know, call up Bruno and say, hey, you want this? I can't do it, so. And I know that they would recommend him for cakes all the time. You'd say, so-and-so told me that you could do this. And it was very friendly amongst the bakers in town. I, I don't think they ever thought that they were cutting into each other's business. I think there was just so much business there for bakeries that it was able to support four bakeries in a town of, you know, 20,000. That's just the way it was. People don't realize there are four, four floors on that U.S. bakery. They had a, a basement 
they had a main floor, they had a dishwashing floor up the, and a, uh, restrooms were up above. Unless, unless some of the people come through the back door like the, the businessmen going for coffee and stuff that come across from the alley like, you know, Fred Mate and Art Barron and all those businessmen and uh, bankers from down and, well, the bankers come in the front door because they walk down the street, but the guys over in Kentucky Street, they come in the back door and come through the bakery to go over there. So uh, that's the only time you'd see anybody outside of that. I never, one or two times you want to take something out in the store to put in a showcase or something and you might see somebody. But my, wife's, my wife had all the had all the contact with all our customers. Well, there was Jeverzonis and uh, Bloomquist and uh, a lot of people are gone now. Uh, Irene Riccioli, the Riccioli's. We had one fellow that uh, worked for Sleepy Hollow Dairy down on Lakeville. Uh, we uh, made, uh, for everyone, he had several kids and we made everyone's birthday cake all the way up from when they were little to the, they were got up to about 20, 20, getting ready to leave home. And uh, I see him in a grocery store every once in a while and he keeps reminiscing about, about back when and when he used to get those cakes and for all these kids. We made them all for the whole family all the way up. <laughs>